Hey, this is Brandon Vietti, one of the producers of Young Justice, and you're listening to Whelm, the Young Justice Files. Recognized Uncle Walker D zero one. Recognized Emily of Arden D one two. Hello, team. Welcome back, and thanks for joining us for episode twenty-two of Whelmed season three. My name is Rich, and with me is my co-host Emily. Hey, everybody. In these review episodes, we'll be diving into the plots, characters, Easter eggs, comic book history, and everything else of Young Justice, and use all of that as a springboard to talk about the creative writing process along the way. Our review segments will avoid any major spoilers for later episodes, but we will be discussing them in detail in our final segment, Crashing the Mode. Son of a... You're all working together! Mr. I don't join Team's Grace and takes me on a rogue mission to Granny's house? Where we're rescued by the co-chair of the Justice League and a Bat Family drone? That's on me. I can explain. Oh, I'm sure it is. And I'm sure you can. But it doesn't stop there. Or start there for that matter. And with all that out of the way, let's hand it over to Emily Ford. Hello, Megan. The title of this week's episode is Antisocial Pathologies. The release date was August 13th, 2019. The in-episode date is January 22nd. It's a one-day one kind of episode. Uh, the writer was Rich Fogel. The director was Christopher Berkeley. And as always, the voice director was Jamie Thomason. In addition to the regular cast and their familiar characters, we also have Zara Fuzzle as Aliza Harmon and Trajectory. Fred Tadasiori as Slade Wilson, and Greg Weissman as Ultra Humanite. Just in time for your next mission. Episode 22 opens with a meeting of the light, recapping last week's episode, and Ultra Humanite and Gretchen Good arguing over who gets to claim Halo. You know, normal villain conversations. <laughs> right. <laughs> we then cut over to Slade Wilson ambushing Tara for a meeting in Hollywood, Slade's starting to doubt her loyalties and warns her that the second she steps out of line, the heroes won't hesitate to take her down. So he gives her something to protect herself, and we don't see what it is until later. Yes. Back at the premiere building, everything's going great! Except Nightwing is still struggling to recover from the X-Pit. While there, Bruce calls an emergency kitchen meeting of the Anti-Light, but Jefferson puts the pieces together finally makes a very public call-out of all of them, gives us a season recap in the process, of course, as well. While all of this is going down, Jace puts a mind control chip on Tara and kidnaps both her and Brion, while convincing Halo to come along as well by telling her that she's finally found a cure for her condition and they're going to go meet her mentor. Yep. It's yeah, fine. this is all a thing, Jeff. You, meanwhile, Jeff. while that horrible magic school bus road trip is going on <laughs> uh back at the premiere building everybody's confronting everybody everyone jefferson's over there shouting at bruce and calder mcgann and connor are having a telepathic argument upstairs garfield's cornered tim and barbara and meanwhile cyborg and uh <laughs> and forager just eating popcorn on the couch watching everything implode uh, but Tim and Barbara confirm to Garfield that most of the Outsiders' major missions were orchestrated in some way by Batman's whole anti-light thing. And nobody's apologizing for any of it, even though maybe they should, but they're I'm not. I'm thinking, no, they're not. Condom and King, though. Condom and King's all theirs. Yep, that one, yep. they did that. They definitely did that. <laughs> they definitely did that thing. <laughs> they definitely took down the villain whose theme is condiments. Yep. That's right. Man whose greatest weapon is ketchup. Over, kids. <laughs> over at Chase's lab, uh, Ultra Humanite arrives with Gretchen Good. They subdue Violet with a cerebral leash from Overlord. Uh, and of course, none of this is how Jace thought her deal was going to go. 
Uh, but she's willing to cooperate as Gretchen shows her what she has planned for Halo, transporting all of them to the X-Pit and revealing that Violet's reflexive healing aura is the key to the anti-life equation. Back at the premiere building, Barbara calls out Bruce on the whole anti-light concept herself. And in the X-Pit, Gretchen reveals that combining Halo's powers with the power of the ghost dimension will remove a person's free will and make the brainwashing of the X-Pit permanent. A theory that she tests by pushing everyone's favorite scientist, Jace, out into the X-Pit and then telling her to reveal all of her terrible, terrible secrets. Turns out that she's horrible. (laughs) Horrible. Uh, Delusional. uh, And views Tara and Brion as her children reborn because of the metagene testing she did on them and now wants to kidnap them, create a family, destroy Halo, and continue her metagene work to make a bigger family. Hashtag Jace did everything wrong. <laughs> everything. Everything. Awful. But, yep. Uh, but after all of that, Jace is now officially mind-controlled by cranny goodness. But Tara frees her brother from his control chip and reveals that what Slade gave her earlier in the episode was a patch to counteract mind control tech protecting her from all of this. Uh, The siblings fight back, but the villains escape, taking Halo with them. The light debriefs after everything's gone down, but Vandal Savage doesn't seem too happy about hearing about the whole anti-life equation, (laughs) since it seems he made a deal to give Darkseid Halo, unaware that that's what she'd be used for. Yeah. We'll get into that. Uh, (laughs) the, (laughs) The Markovs return to the premiere building, breaking the news to Jefferson and insisting that they've got to go find Halo since Jace is evil now. (sighs) Whoops, all evil. Yeah. Uh, (laughs) Yeah, and Jefferson's just done. Yeah, Jefferson's not happy this episode. He's done. This is a lot of shouting for him. (laughs) Yes, he's canceled you all. Out in space, we see Gretchen Good deliver Halo to Granny Goodness. Yeah. There's two of them. There's a Gretchen Good and a Granny Goodness. Yeah. And to close out the episode, Tara makes a phone call to Slade to tell him that he was right the whole time about the heroes being untrustworthy and asks what he needs her to do now. Yeah. Yeah. This is a happy, upbeat, feel-good episode, (laughs) right, Rich? Right. Right. I just don't... Aster's just not... It's got some dis in it. Dis... Yeah. Let's, let's so go over it, though. It's the weird thing where it's like, I, li- I like it, but none of it oh, makes yeah. me happy. Where I'm like, this is a good, well-thought-out episode with tons of answers and like a really fast-moving plot and everything going down. And at the same time, I'm sitting here and I'm like, no. Yeah. Yeah. Them, got the answers we kept asking relax. for. <laughs> didn't want any of those answers. <laughs> One of the answers, didn't want them. All right, let's do it. Superboy, are you all right? I'm fine. Feeling the answer. Where do we start? You want me to start? Yeah, yeah. Go for it. So, hi. Slade Wilson makes me unreasonably angry. Uh, It's actually, it's completely reasonable. No, it's very reasonable, yes. (laughs) But to to qualify that, it's one of those things where I understand that the show wants me to feel that way about him, so I'm not sitting here like, oh, I can't believe the show did this. I'm sitting here like, of course the show did this. This is the perfect way for me to hate this man. All right. Various things being, as I seem to say every episode this season on my millionth watch through of this episode, I had a thought. <laughs> I had a thought. Oh, um, oh goodness. That pre credit scene with uh, Tara and Slade, Emily's hot take of the day. I think there is a chance that Slade absolutely grabbed Tara like that on purpose just to trigger her PTSD about being kidnapped. You mean, it, oh, grab her in the alleyway, you mean? Yeah. Because like the way oh. the way that because they cut they do a match cut from him putting his hand over her mouth to the flashback of her getting kidnapped by the meta traffickers who are doing the yeah. exact same thing as they drag her backwards and you cannot there is no way that Slade doesn't know that that's how she how she got attacked yeah of I am one hundred percent convinced Slade yeah. knows exactly how she was attacked for what whether she told him or he found out uh, so there is no way Slade did that on uh, by accident. 
No. I think he was trying to put her on guard and off balance from the beginning because Slade Wilson is a genius, horrible, horrible man. Yeah. I think you're right. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate I the validate, validation on, I my, validate you. on my wild theories. <laughs> Along those same lines, who boy is the uh, you're soft and that's why they took you line the most horrible victim blamey thing I've ever heard in a while Uh, because it makes him right and her wrong and it her fault that she got hurt. And that's horrible. This all of the flashbacks related to this opening thing are the exact kind of horrible that works related to that in the same conversation in the alleyway. I have always heard this line and have not thought about it nearly enough. And I don't think I've seen anybody talking about it as much as it might deserve. Where when uh, Slade is accusing everyone in Tara's life of not doing enough to help her except him, which is horrible. One of the things he says is, do you think Brion cared about you when he invited you to London and then went clubbing while you were abducted? And I have so, yeah. and this is such a passing line that gives me so many more questions about yeah. who Brion was before we met him. Yeah. And we may or may not ever get answers to those, but I think this is a telling line that gets brushed over very quickly. Yeah. We're introduced to Brion as like kind of a. As he's trying to be honorable and he wants to protect, he wants to save his sister and protect her. But knowing this, if this is true, Slade might be lying. But to me, there's some level of thinking that might be true just because like Tara doesn't disagree with him and Tara would have known where her brother was on some level since she was there with him. Yep. Implies to me that like there's a lot of guilt behind Brion. Yeah. Brion isn't just like, oh, I want to save my sister because my sister got hurt and I want to help her. He's like, ah, this is my fault. And there's a little bit of that that might be true. Brion might not be the, not have been the best guy before we met him. And that's that's its own kettle of fish to unpack. Yeah. Maybe we'll talk about a crash of the boat a little bit. Maybe. Possibly. We'll see. Yeah. Yeah. I have nothing, nothing else to say that probably wouldn't be in crash in the mode, I think. Nothing wrong with clubbing. Something a little wrong with clubbing when you're like 13-year-old sister's there and you're supposed to be looking after her and you just kind of maybe just abandon her in your hotel room. Like, that's that's more iffy. Yeah, a little bit. But other things, to move away from Slade for a little while because, gosh, that man. <laughs> I'm pretty sure this episode is the first time we've ever seen Tim without his mask. I think that's true. Just fun facts because I don't yeah. remember it in the previous season. We've seen, okay, wait. No, I'm lying. He goes undercover in season two. He's in the Now That's a Rutabaga episode, but he's wearing that's glasses. That's true. Isn't oh, he? right. Yes, I'm sure he is. He's doing I'm the sure, Robin I, I don't thing. even remember. I'm sure he does. <laughs> when you become Robin, you are handed a costume, a mask, and a pair of very, very dark sunglasses. Dark sunglasses. It's, all in, it's all in the intro kit. I am sure that's the case. Even if you did, even if you were like previously a different superhero who has now become Robin, and you didn't do it while you were a different superhero, the second you become Robin, it's like no, I must hide my identity. Yes, but related related to Batman imposing the sunglasses rule on all of his proteges, I really like that we get to see Dad Bats in this episode. We rarely like we rarely get to see Batman this concerned. And, like, it's subdued in comparison to some of the other parents we see in this series, but that's because this is Batman. And him yeah. even freaking out a little bit is like him having a breakdown in front of everyone. And yeah. I like it. It works. I like that he cares. I have, we say this all the time, but I have always loved that Young Justice Batman cares about his kids. Yes. And he's still, like, there's still so much of this get the mission done. Batman, right? Even in just this episode. Yeah. I think we talked about this maybe in, in the Scream Something episode, but just this idea that that this Batman also has things he doesn't know. Yeah. Right? So this thing of like, uh I, I can't I can't fix this. Yeah. Like this isn't a supervillain. I can't I can't put a, a twelve part you know, strategic plan in place to help Dick's brain stop swelling, right? I just have to do what somebody else tells me to do. And that's not 
I'm sure that's not comfortable for him. Which makes so much of what happens in this episode with him make even more sense. Just the idea of he is going through this panicked dad moment and yeah. going, you know what I can do? I can focus on making sure my job works. Yeah. I, there is nothing I can do to help my son right now, but I can make my right. job work. And then Jefferson throws that out the window and nothing goes well. Right. And with, I don't know if it's a critique, but like an observation, like we don't know exactly what Jace's background is. Like, I mean, what even kind if she's of a doctor is this woman? Yeah. So, I mean, she seems like, okay, you're a geneticist. Is that what you are? Or is she, a, I mean, is she a medical doctor with genetics as a, I mean, she probably knows how to throw in an IV. She looks like, I mean, in the past, like they'd shown her like giving injections and knowing with that kind of stuff that a geneticist might not actually be doing very much of. So, I mean, she might be an MD, but we're talking like, a, like a, a, a neurologic code when someone's brain is swelling trust me I, i've been in these it's it's not good <laughs> and uh we do more than just put some ice on someone they certainly put a lot of ice on him but um yeah a few injections uh some other things should probably be done um of course so i i can't really necessarily call this a critique the, the medicine's fine uh to an extent but it does make me wonder like how much are they, you got to pick your battles, I guess, as a writer. Like, are they going to introduce, you know, Dr. Midnight or somebody like into like the lineup just so they have someone to call on. Right. And I'm thinking like, is there anyone else in the league that's really like a medical doctor? I will note as much as the, as shouting, what kind of doctor is this woman is very fun. <laughs> They, she is at the beginning of the season, uh, the Markov's family doctor. Yes, and I, I mean, again, you got to, again, you got to pick your battles. Like a PCP, like a, like a general practitioner for a family physician, also probably not going to do a, a neuro code like on a patient. Fair enough, selling, right? But again, you pick your pick your battles. Like you, there is a thing about conservation of characters, right? Yes. I mean, as much as we talk about the the huge cast of of Young Justice and so much of this ensemble cast you gotta decide like when do we need to need to for a plot point situation like introduce a whole new character into this thing who are we going to introduce into this situation plus yeah. let's see then it brings up so many other questions like in in brion talking about like wait a minute is bruce wayne dick grayson's dad it's like i brought this up before like you can't google that like he's the adopted ward of the one of the richest men in the world you probably know you can find out who he is but then, like, Jace is there. So, like, she knows Dick is Nightwing and Bruce is showing up. Like, does, I mean, it gets back into the question of, like, how many, I mean, did the, does the light know everyone's secret identities now? Like, I mean, Rachel Gould theoretically knew Bruce, at least in the comics, he knew who Bruce was, right? So, like, I don't know. Brings up this thing. The entirety of Gotham City knows that Batman is Bruce Wayne and they all just play along to make him feel right. better. <laughs> right. But on the topic of Jace and what the heck kind of doctor she is, I will note, this is something that I'd kind of been noticing throughout the season and just hadn't really brought up that much, but had been noticing on this rewatch. There are several points where Jace does things as like, a quote unquote normal medical doctor and then but they're not right like they but they're just a little bit wrong or somebody calls her out on something being not exactly right like there's it's random things and it may just be me putting on my tinfoil hat and overthinking it here which is like fair. what like give me give me any examples off the top of your head so, when cyborg is going through his whole thing and they're trying to figure out what to do with him uh and what's wrong and she's like set him up in bed and run some tests or whatever. She's like, he's stable. And then immediately after she says that he's stable, Dreamer walks in and goes, he's not stable at all. Uh, and then right. they plow That's past true. it and move on. When Beast Boy comes in after the whole Condiment King mission, he's he has like a sprained wrist or something. And she goes to examine it. And when she does, she like immediately moves it in a way that hurts. And he's like, yeah. ow, what, what did you just do? And she's like, oh, it's. You're just sprained. You'll be fine. And they move on. And I'm like, 
why, why would you do that if you were like, I feel like someone who had some experience dealing with a sprained wrist wouldn't be like, let me immediately move your arm so it hurts. And just little things like that. It, it would be handled a little differently. Like, yes, can you move it like this? Can you move it like that? You don't just grab somebody's arm. That's probably true. Yes. So it's little so. things that may 100% be me overthinking things that are not meant to be overthought. But I can put I together a headcanon that Jace is not supposed to be a medical doctor and is just kind right. of doing her best, quote unquote. Yeah, with what you've got. Right. It's like when they call out, like, is there a doctor on this flight? I'm like, you don't seem to know how Western medicine works. Like, I mean, yeah, OK, there might be a doctor on the flight. But what if the doctor is like a podiatrist or right <laughs> You know what I mean? Like, yeah, I guess they went through the training, you know, as opposed to, you know, like, I, I don't know, trained code nurses, like <laughs> whatever. It's always a thing. But like I said, law of conservation of characters, you got to kind of do your thing. You got to pick your battles. I can see how Jace could say like he's stable in that he's not going through any change. He's not going through changes anymore. Yes. But she's not she's not understanding that it's tied to his emotional state. Yes. I can kind of I can kind of get that. I don't want to give her credit for anything, but like, yeah. Yeah, pretty much. Yep, but tinfoil hat off. We can yeah. place it right over there and move on <laughs> okay, to right. my next? next thing. Uh, to move away from our chaos theories about Dr. Jace. Random thing, fun little Easter egg that I've noticed a couple of times and I'm finally remembering to bring up. And it, this might be the first episode that we see it, but we see it through the rest of the season. For both the earlier this season and I think uh, season two as well, Gar's like... St- standard civilian outfit was a Batman t-shirt. Oh, like like a bat t-shirt. Yeah. Uh-huh. But in this episode, he's got a new one and it's what we will come to find out is the Outsiders logo. Boy <laughs> went and made merch. Uh, and I'm proud of him. Uh, I don't think we have like, we don't have, I think because when we did uh, the Scream Somethings, it didn't come up because we didn't have context for it yet. So this is technically crashing the mode, but not really. Like we see, we right. start seeing it in some of their social media stuff and stuff like that of the right. little like crosshairs with the O in the middle. That's like cool wavy thing. And as I'm saying it, I'm thinking maybe it might be like a metagene thing. Like it might be like a reference to something. It might be some sort of medical gene thing that I don't know. Because I don't know what science looks like. <laughs> I haven't looked at the. I haven't. I haven't done an analysis of the uh, of the logo. Actually, I, I'm having a hard time bringing it up in my head. Yeah, I think it's just an O. I don't know what the rest of that business is. It doesn't look like science. It doesn't look like science, Rich. You'd Could know be, more I mean, than me. I don't know. I I'm mean... an English and theater major. <laughs> My one science <laughs> class was astronomy. <laughs> to, to harken back to the Jace episode, I have a marine biology degree and a nursing degree, not a Both genetics degree. Both of those degree. are more science <laughs> That's than true. me. That's true. That's true. I can talk about neural codes. This? I don't know about this. Yeah. but It's yeah. so funny. I never even really noticed that. The, well, uh, now you have. If somebody I has have, any insight and into I can't the- And unsee it. Someone has any insight- into what the heck the Outsiders logo is, or if it's just a wonky O that's made to look cool. Totally fine also. Yeah. But if there's something we're missing, shout at us on Twitter about it. In a, in a ring outside a ring outside the O with like a mark for each person on the team? I don't know. But then what if you add or subtract people from the team? Like that's know. the problem with when you design logos around how many people are in your team. I guess that's fair, but the flag of the states changed. I don't know. It's my weird analogy. Anyway, let's talk about Tara Tara. Hi. I want to give Tara 12 hugs in this episode. It is just so painful to yeah. watch this and to see and to see Slade be right. Yeah. Is part of it because he is right so on some right. level. He lays out cuz Part of it is he doesn't, he makes a very simple statements. He doesn't say anything too specific and he just goes, yeah, no, they'll betray you. They will betray you. That is what they will do. That is just how they are. If they find out you have done anything wrong, they will betray you. And yes. then life lines up perfectly to show Tara yeah. a vision in which heroes find out about each other doing things that they consider wrong and just start screaming at each other. Yeah. 
And um, I, I, obviously, I mean, I, maybe not obviously, but it seems to me like he had no idea this was coming, like Slade. He's just doing the classic, well, I'm going to undermine your confidence in things by just, I don't even think lying, like using some manipulation of the truth. Like not everybody can be perfect all the time. So what he's saying is, yeah, probably going to show up. But if you if you talk to her about it and lean her thought process toward a certain interpretation, then even small things might come up. But in this case, yeah. everything exploded like right in front of her. And part of it is he did know some of it was coming. He knew Jace was going to try to get her out. Yes. He knew Jace was going to mind control her to get her out. And he gave her the thing to be like, see, trust me instead of this woman that you yeah. think is on the side of the heroes, but isn't. Because yeah. Tara also doesn't know all of that going on behind the scenes. That's and fair. She's like, J- That's fair. In her mind, Jace and Slade are separate problems she's dealing with when in reality right. they are working together, even though Slade is also betraying Jace. In a way. Yes. Sort of. Yes. Exactly. So yeah. he knew that uh. was coming. So he knew either way there was going to be an authority figure in her life who would attempt to control her. And he would be the person who was honest with her and protected her from another authority figure betraying her. He also just got lucky that at that exact moment, the entire Justice League Team Outsiders Coalition decided to just go at each other. Yeah. Ah, there's so much happening in this one. But before we get to all of that, I also am just pointing out continuing... With every detail they put into how these flashback scenes with Tara and Slade work makes them, my my notes just say, oh, this is so uncomfy, which is an (laughs) understatement, but entirely accurate. Yeah. Because it's just that progression from Tara getting so frustrated and so upset in that flashback scene that she like for a second kind of tries to kill Slade. (laughs) Like she attacks him with a giant rock. That could, that could kill a man. Yes. And he stops it and takes her down, screams at her until she is curled up in a ball on the ground, worried for whatever is going to happen next. The consequence. And then immediately changes direction and just goes, but I'm so proud of you. And so she just like gives up and hugs him because she is just so happy that he hasn't hurt her. And that is so screwed up. And gosh, I hate Slade Wilson. Yeah. And we were talking about Get this thing. Get Tara about this. all the therapy. <laughs> so like watching Bruce, right? We've been talking, you know, we've talked in the past about yes. this idea of Bruce's parallels to Lex, like leading the kind of the light, the anti-light, the this kind of thing that's dancing back and forth. And then, you know, but Lex doesn't have a protege, right? So here we get to see this thing, this other mirror of, of Bruce with Deathstroke, right? With Slade and Tara and how they interact. Right. And and what that training is like. And you you made a comment in here like that. I think it beautifully. One of my notes is just about how you get this juxtaposition between all of that and the scene where Barbara feels entirely comfortable just going up to Bruce and calling him out. Yes. Barbara is not afraid in that scene. Barbara is not even hesitant in that scene. We see complete confidence in Barbara in being able to go up to her one of her mentors, an adult that she respects and has grown up with interacting and just going, you're wrong yeah. and has no fear of any retaliation beyond like having a discussion and maybe an argument. Yeah. And and how she does it, too. I mean, she's approaching it like, look at this from J- like because it starts yeah. with Bruce with Bruce saying, I, I, I wish Jefferson could just understand that what we were why, that we were just trying to protect him and, and Barbara going like, hold up, like. I'm in this too, right? I'm, I'm, I, we all decided that we were going to do this. I am not going to, even though I'm going to call you out on the fact that your team is made of your protégés who are used to following your orders, that does not absolve me, right? I got to make this choice and I chose to make this choice. So I don't get to put my, put the blame for what's happening entirely on you, right? That's responsibility right there, number one. But still calling out like, look, what is going on? Like, what do you think is happening here, Bruce? Because what you think is happening here, I think you might be deluding yourself into what's going on here. Like, whose plan is this? You know, like, yeah, okay, great. Bring up Diana. But she's not here. Yeah. Right? It's all a fait accompli, right? She only knows after we do stuff, basically. And she's not here to call you out, right? And she calls you out every time we call her on the phone, right? Yeah. 
So, mm, right? What? Yeah. And with with that whole scene, you get like Barbara. I love that she points out the whole thing about the protégés because it hadn't crossed my mind until yeah. Barbara brought it up. And it's one of those things that seems so obvious in retrospect. And her taking responsibility for it is this just this moment of her being like, yes, I made this choice, but there was not an equal power balance in me making this choice. Yes. Yes. And oh my gosh. Yes. So looking at it deeper and deeper and deeper, Tara is making decisions and she's making the best decision she has with the information she's being she's being given. She's trying her best, right? Slate is manipulating her in very overt ways that outside people can look at and go like, that is awful, right? But is Bruce, like, where is that, where does it cross over from what Bruce is doing to what Slate is doing, right? Like, I don't know if Bruce is manipulating the team, but no. as they get older and he's saying like, no, I know what's right. This is the mission. This is what needs to have happen. We need to do X, Y, or Z. When you have a bunch of people who are trained to be like, yeah, he trained me. If I didn't do what he said, like I, I have learned over years that Bruce is a few is steps ahead of other people. And so if I choose to not do what he says, I could, but then every time I did that, I or somebody else got really badly hurt. Right? So I've learned to trust his judgment, right? There's still a power imbalance there, like you're saying, right? And so but as they're older, Barbara also recognizes like, yes, there is a power imbalance here. Yes, you've set this thing up. Also uh, I'm not going to remove my own agency <laughs> Yeah. in this conversation. Absolutely. I am not going to erase the agency for myself, for Tim, for anybody else who's on this team that made this decision, Diana or anybody else. But what I, I will do is call you out and I will call me out, right? I will call us out, right? If you think that, if you think that basically like we're saying they, the rest of our teammates can't protect themselves, how arrogant is that? <laughs> Right. Maybe we yes. weren't right. Maybe we thought we were doing the right thing at the right time. And maybe it was, maybe it wasn't. We don't necessarily know, but, but we need to look at this and, and Jefferson has some points and we need to think about that. Like it's, it's just, uh, and the fact that Tara has powers, right. And like, you see this thing where you see Tara who has powers and juxtapose that with Barbara who has no powers, right. And there is a there is a, a physical power imbalance too, right, in that thing as well. So there's yet Barbara's like, Yeah. I'm I'm rolling up here and calling you out. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. All right. think, I'm done. <laughs> You're done. I have one more thing. Uh, I have one more thing to say about this. Good. Uh, I think part of it is also that because you're bringing up like what where is the line, the difference between what it, Slade is doing and what Bruce is doing. And I think part of it, at least for me as a viewer, is the fact that Bruce seems genuinely willing to listen. Like, he, like Barbara will challenge him and he will respond with his reasoning. But like when she like the way that scene is framed to me reads like when Barbara rolls away, when Barbara goes away, Bruce like thinks about what she's saying. Like, I don't yeah. think Bruce just goes, oh, she's younger. She's my protege. Her thoughts don't matter on this. I don't. I think Bruce sits there and goes, hmm, maybe these kids are right and kind of has to do his own introspection in a way that I don't think Slade ever does. Oh, no, um, no. <laughs> Slade. No. <laughs> I think Bruce is genuinely willing to admit sometimes that he is a fallible human in right. a way that Slade doesn't seem to be willing to. Like Batman is arrogant and always thinks he's right, except when he doesn't. Uh, yeah. And when he is presented with enough people going, maybe you were wrong about this. I think he does kind of take a step back and goes, hmm, maybe I was wrong about this. Yeah. And it's a little bit, I think, some of the intention behind it. Like, I don't think Bruce purposefully went, I'm going to get a bunch of sidekicks together so I'm in charge and they can break the law with me. I think he kind of looked at, like, who is in charge of things that I trust because part of it I think is a trust thing. Like he trusts Nightwing and he trusts Tim to get things done. Right. It just so happens that that leads into a not great power imbalance of all of these people who he trusts are also the yeah. ones who are just willing to trust him well, in return and do what he says. It's an, it's kind of an inadvertent, 
nepotism, yeah. right? Yeah. And you and you, yeah. I mean, you can look at McGann and Calder as not necessarily falling into the same role as Tim and Barbara and Dick, but the fact that they were on the team yeah. and he led them on the team, gave them missions and trained them on the team, it starts making their line pretty fuzzy, you know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. All right. Enough of that. Bruce versus Deathstroke. I this vote is Bruce. what people come here for. That's but right. <laughs> to, to switch gears again, because we're just yes. switching all Let's over the it. place. One of my favorite little things from this episode is the fact that McGann and Connor are having a completely silent subplot through the entire episode. Yeah. And I get that on some level, it's probably a decision to save money on voice acting and we can't have 10 million actors in every episode. And we, yeah, but, all they, of did, that. but, it, but, but they did it in a way that, that does both. Right. It exactly. does. It's the, it does both. It's like, I get that this was probably on some level an economic decision, but it works well. You did one that works really, really well because right. like we've established that they talk through their psychic link all yeah. the time. And it shows like, even in this moment where they are both like ha- very upset, they're still like, we're just, we're going to talk in our mind palace. Give right. us a minute. Right. Um, and then Garfield, like we, I think like it was mentioned before earlier, Garfield just saying like McGann, like yelling at her with his brain. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like he just kind of bursts into the room, slams the door <laughs> and then they go back. to. And I love, and I love that part of it is like, like they show Superboy react to it too. Mm-hmm. Like mm-hmm. I'm like, oh, mm-hmm. that's that's so it. Like I love the mechanics of how the telepathy works on the show. Of like that Absolutely. concept of of Garfield just kind of barging into that conversation mentally, <laughs> uh, and both of them knowing that he did it. Because like I feel like Superboy also definitely heard that or some level of that was somehow aware of that, and it just it works really well. And we get to. We get to see some. We get to see some of the fallout of that in the next uh, couple of episodes. But it's very nice having that little seed of it right here. That and the fact that we don't get to hear either of them also works well because they're not the point of view characters for this episode. Like this episode is focusing on several other people more specifically. They are being peripheral characters right now. Yeah, but yeah. they're still part of the story, and we're still getting to see it. Like we, they don't just pretend they're not there. They yes. show us what's going on with them. <laughs> Yes. And it's good it's good little world building stuff like that. Good Absolutely. psychic telepathic argument upstairs. Love it. And yeah, most of my other stuff is just gosh, I hate Jace. <laughs> and a little bit about how like Barbara laying out both to Bruce and to Garfield kind of two sides of the coin about how sometimes the anti light makes sense. And I like that they go out of their way to show us that they're like this isn't a black and white conflict in that way of this particular part of the season, this whole subplot about what if Batman makes an illegal underground vigilante group Yeah, is both. They're like, there are good and bad things about this. And it doesn't let the show or the viewers just go, this was a bad idea across the board. It's like, no, there are, there are a couple of moments in the season where you're like, this was the best thing you could do with what you were given. And there are yeah. other moments where you go, this was a horrible idea. Horrible idea. Yes, agreed. agreed. And I like that they're able to balance that in a way that I believe it, in a way that I'm sitting there hearing Barbara lay out everything and going, I don't know if I agree with you, but I feel like I need to listen to you. Like that yeah. way that I'm not just sitting there through that whole scene going, oh, whatever, stop it. Stop trying to convince me this was a good idea. I'm sitting there like, mm, you make, you make a point. You make a point that I can understand. I like it. More of that. <laughs> yes, I agree. <laughs> hashtag Jace Watch. That's your hashtag uh, that, Jace that Watch. Was your, that was your last bit. We've we've caught up to hashtag Jace Watch. <laughs> hashtag Jace Watch is no longer part of Crashing the Mode. We can talk about it openly and freely because just gosh, Jace. Literally, like <laughs> taking my notes for this episode, I was like, how do I sum up every point? along this reveal that makes me just scream for hours and instead of writing detailed yeah. notes breaking down each of her points and how they are just wild to look at uh my yeah. notes simply say gosh i hate jace yeah and that's it I that's just, where my I, notes I, end. I, I i i'm quoting my wife 
because I know this is what she would say. Jace, who hurt you? Like, you know, like Fair something enough. something happened to Jace's childhood and growth. Like, she was broken in some really unfortunate ways. And that stuff where she feels like she's doing the right things, quote unquote, is it's abuse. It's abuse. It's generational abuse. Something is happening there. Ugh. Ugh. It's awful. I know we've been do- we've been doing Jace Watch 2019. Uh, I'm kind of cataloging all of the stuff Jace says that makes us go, oh boy, get that woman away from these children. Yes. But one of the main ones rewatching this episode for the millionth time was my mind just going back to that hairbrush conversation for the 10 millionth time uh... and being like, I have questions. Like, has Jace ever had actual children? This makes me think no. Her whole confession makes me think no. But it makes me wonder, like, what was her relationship like with Tara for any of that? And how did did they ever interact? What was that? Is Jace just lying during that conversation when she's like, oh, I had a, I had a daughter, but I lost her. And this used to calm her down. And I lost her. And I'm so sad about losing her. And I'm like, some of that makes sense. But did you... Did you ever have to calm Tara down? Is that ever a thing you did? We, I have such questions. Yeah, agreed. I might have to go back and rewatch, do another Jace Watch 2019. I don't know if I can Jace handle Watch another one. What? <laughs> I don't know if I can handle another one. I, I can't. <laughs> I can't. Uh, most of my stuff is in uh, Canary Debrief and uh, some Crashing the Mode. But, um, God, Jeff. Poor just, Jeff. It just doesn't. Get that. The man punches. A break. The punch punches don't stop, and to the point where at the end, where he's just like, "I'm out of here." Where's Helga? Like he's turning to her, and the early scene where she's like, "You're a lifesaver," and he's like, "No, that's your job." Like he's just so into her, and then to find out, like the last thing he needs to have his entire world crumble is the only person he thought that he could rely on was also manipulating him in terrible, terrible ways. Like, I, and even, like, Calder, I love you, man. It's not really okay to tell someone, I'm sorry I made you, f- I'm sorry you feel this way. Like, I, I'm i not sure how to handle that. Yeah. I handle it as Calder is a fallible human like all of us. Yes. And no, Calder no, is absolutely. A young, stressed 20 something trying to maneuver yes. his way through this conversation. Yes. <laughs> it's like nobody's saying they're sorry. Yeah. Oh, uh, Jeff. And nobody's apologizing for any of it. <laughs> Nothing. Subtitle of this episode. <laughs> Nothing. Yeah. No one's sorry, really. All right. Well, my stuff I'm going to I'm gonna hold off for a little bit later. We got a few things from, from Neil. Uh, he says What's the bad Neil gotta say. He says the bad family are awesome scenes, especially Bruce cosplaying as Steve Jobs. Apparently, that leave leave <laughs> Bruce alone. Bruce's fashion sense. There's a couple things in here that are cra- that are crashing the mode for Neil. He says the black lighting reveal scene is one of the absolute best in the season. Uh, dynamic music uh, partners absolutely crushes it in this scene with the music. So good. <laughs> The flashback that Tara has in the car and the 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 subtle smirk uh, makes perfect sense once you see what you know figure out what Deathstroke actually gave her. The whole dialogue behind the anti light and the reveal is such good character building and conversation. It's one of the few times I wanted longer cuts uh, of of each little storyline going on. Oh man, <laughs> he's all Jace did nothing wrong yet. Wait for it. Okay, now. <laughs> I still think there's a lot of discussion around the fact that the amount of manipulation, brokenness surrounding Jace, damage to Jefferson is the reason I never wanted it to be true. Yeah, it's a true statement as well. Yeah, like I'm I'm totally up for Jace getting some therapy and working through whatever has led her to be like this. Yeah. But also, she's n- not being a good person and nice. <laughs> having trauma does not absolve her of Having off-screen trauma that we've never had any real indication of beyond assuming and the title of this episode uh, does not absolve her of the fact that she tried to kidnap two kids and destroy another one. Yes. That that makes the person go to prison. <laughs> yes, it does. 
Uh, on some lighter notes, Neil says, love the shot of the premiere building specifically because we get a big belly burger sign and a chicken whizzies sign, which I did not see. <laughs> and then 16, uh, this week, uh, 1616 on the orphanage, one for each granny, he says. Nice. Hey. <laughs> All right, let's get our uh, debrief, fan service, etc. Let's do it. Stick around. Class is in session. In our Canary Debrief, we'll be discussing what we can learn about the creative process from the episodes we review. Why is Tara working with Slade? Is Jace a confirmed threat or misunderstood ally? Does the Anti-Light understand the consequences of their actions? <laughs> Does Superboy know that McGann is a part of this? Is he a part of it? Does he know what's going on? What is the Anti-Life equation? So many big questions answered in this episode, right? Some slate being cleared and then some more questions coming up. This episode answered so many questions for us. It's a perfect example of the setting things up and knocking them down aspect of Young Justice storytelling. But while it gave us <laughs> painful <laughs> but direct answers to some of our biggest questions this season, it also introduced enough new questions to bring us into a, a focused direction for this conclusion. So there are two grannies. Okay, got that answer, but also more questions. What will Vandal's response be to this balance of power upset that we've been seeing through this whole episode or season so far? Obviously, can they save Halo? Can they save Tara after this blow up? And how would they manage to do that? Who's the missing member of the light in these scenes that they keep focusing on the fact that there's an empty screen somewhere? When you have so many varied questions through a season with such a large cast involved in these questions, this here, the last episode and this episode, perfect time to tighten up the through line so that you can head into a smaller number of questions. But those questions, though there may be fewer of them, increase the jeopardy of the characters. If you can focus that in, answer a bunch of the things that you need to have answered, and then bring up a few things to kind of get you aimed in toward the end. It'll help your audience stay focused on the run to the finish line. I've uh, admired your stance on animal rights for years. All right. In fan service, we take some time to highlight the amazing fan-related creations celebrating DC, Young Justice, and other creative works that we think that Young Justice fans will love. So this week, this week in fan service, we have some art that Neil picked up for us, actually. It's some fan art specifically for Blue Beetle, which I really, really love. And this is, we have a, we'll have a link to the DVNR page. It's, it's from Duo Hong. And it says, the title is Blue Beetle Kajida Stage 2. Um, if any of you remember our conversation with Jeff Stormer talking about Blue Beetle, uh, Ted Kord, Kajida was this word that would be used to activate the original magic scarabee thing that the original Blue Beetle had. Not the Ted Kord, but the one who came before him. And this art is amazing. It is kind of like this advancement of the Blue Beetle armor into like almost kind of an Egyptian-ish style, which I find really interesting, which also for some reason brings up some questions for me as well. Like there's a lot of Egyptian connection, obviously, or or Egyptian era, right? Egyptian uh, civilization, height, heightened civilization. I wonder what's the word I'm looking for. I don't know. I would like, help, but I'm not sure. That's stylization? Okay. Yeah, there's a there's a stylization of ancient Egypt and that culture that was in ancient Egypt that is incorporated into this art design. But also there's uh, a lot of that through the DC universe in general, uh, including the Hawks history. And so I'm wondering, like, if the scarab landed and anybody, I wonder if anybody was using it at the time that it, if they're using the Thanagarian history of, like, the Thanagarian ship landing in ancient Egypt and the influence of that and the reincarnation, all that kind of stuff for the Hawks. I wonder if there's any crossover with Blue Beetle. That would be really cool. Um, but there's also tin some... Tinfoil hat time, I know, this time tin, in the fan foil. service. <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah, and there's if you go to the link that we're going to put in there, there's also some other art there that's actually uh, really interesting. It, it links you over to some things from, from different uh, artists, including uh, Needham Comics. Um, did this really interesting uh, Earth 2, Dr. Midnight, and Silver Scarab one that was really cool. I brought up Dr. Midnight earlier in this scene, but in this case, Dr. Midnight, uh, uh, instead of being a, a white male character, uh, looks like a, a, a woman of color, which is really, really cool. Um, and Silver Scarab is was one of the Infinity Incorporated members from the original Infinity Incorporated 
that I have talked about sometime in, um, in in the past regarding this Infinity Incorporated thing that came up today again. There's some crashing the mode stuff in there that we're going to get into about that that Neil brought up. But anyway, check some of that artwork out uh, and enjoy it and pop over to let them know that you really enjoyed it and where you, where you saw it from, from where, who pointed you in that direction. Tell us something we don't know yet. Sorry, BB. We can't risk altering the time stream. We do that, we're all feeling the mode. Our earlier segments assume listeners have only seen up to this episode in Season 3. In Crashing the Mode, we'll be discussing spoilers and foreshadowing for future episodes, as well as plot elements from the original DC storylines that may affect what we see later on. We may also drop theories and speculations about what's to come based on wild flights of fancy. If you're spoiler wary, this is your warning. The first thing that I want to bring up is what Neil was just saying. Lex is so good at running Infinity Incorporated that even the, the team thinks they're doing a good job. <laughs> uh, yep. Yeah, that's a thing. The, the other thing that I wanted to bring up is a, is a shout out here. We mentioned a couple times this episode, this empty space in the light lineup. So we know now that the space is for Bozovi <laughs> because of his manipulation of Brion and yep. Brion's brother at the beginning of the season, at the end of the season. But there's a speculation that came up on Twitter, <laughs> and I'd like to give a shout out to uh, Assassin Bots at at S A S A M B O T S on Twitter, who wrote us to remind us that Bazovi isn't the only character this season who we have seen using emotion influencing powers. I have been wondering when it came up why someone of Bazovi's power level would be allowed as a cornerstone member of the Light, but what if it's Macom? I don't think we've seen McGann and Bazovi in the same scene together. I can't remember any of those. It would make sense narratively as to why McCom was introduced into the show early in the season. And then we didn't just see him again for the rest of the season, which is a kind of a strange thing for, for young justice to do shape-shifting powers, emotion, influencing powers. Do, do, does the light know that Bazovi is McCom is McCom working for dark side, which seemed to be implied by McCom's, influence of yeah of mantis and the other bugs is he a plant <laughs> i have questions i'm sorry i know you meant that as like is he a, is he a secret agent but my mind just is he really as, is he a, plant? a photosynthetic organism <laughs> <laughs> i apologize this is what finals week has done to me i was sitting here just calmly <laughs> listening to you and then i lost it that's right. Is he a but plant? What I was going to say is, uh, you and Sassenbots have have the same hat, and it's made of tinfoil. Total tinfoil hat. I you are want... absolutely <laughs> the same hat meme. <laughs> this whole this whole season, I've been like, what if they're Macom? Like it's just everyone Literally, is Macom. You respond Literally. to yeah. every character that we have questions <laughs> about with what if they're Macom? <laughs> Granny's Macom. Tara's Macom. Everybody's Macom. But Sophie's Macom. The problem is Makama has too many cool powers. Oh, it's, it's, the, the telekinetic yeah. powers are proof that Tara is definitely Makam. Makam everywhere. Oh, God. But so funny. Speaking of the Zovi, to go back to what we were saying earlier about stuff we couldn't talk more about until Crash oh, yeah. in the Mode. Brion! I know. I know. This is this rewatch has been a lot of kind of picking up on little things that imply Brion is not as heroic as he may occasionally appear to make that final heel turn make sense. Yeah. And I I think it's interesting that like that cuz I hadn't really like noticed or picked up on that line until this time through and just kind of thinking about that in terms of everything else and it's not it's not a direct line from one to the other no but it puts that little bit of doubt into his character and into everything we've seen him doing that kind of makes it work a little a little continues to make that ending scene work more and more for me as i go back and rewatch stuff of seeing like oh yeah. it only takes just enough of getting rid of Brion's inhibitions to make him do something that you're like, that's not great, my dude. Yeah. Well, and so look, we all make. I mean, God, well, how old was he? Sixteen, like something like you, that. We all. How old we is all, Brion? I don't remember eight, anymore. Why was he out clubbing? He's a child. Eight, Eighteen. So two years before that would have been sixteen. Yeah. Why are you right? clubbing as a child, Brion? <laughs> that's not. Stop it. Maybe I just didn't do anything so, as a teenager, but my gosh. 
Uh, hard same. Hard same. I was in my I was in my uh, I was in my house on the weekends with the buddies gaming. So yes, we. I, so I look at Brion's situation and what I what I want to be the case in looking back on this line that's brought up this episode is that Brion made a terrible terrible mistake. Yes. And from that moment forward, he is like, he he has changed, and yes. is trying to move to to do to, to make up for this terrible thing that he cannot go back and change. Right? I absolutely agree. Right. So great, I'm in. But we get this thing that we know that happens at the end of the season, right? Yep. And <laughs> we're and in crash in the mode. We can say what it is. We just yeah, yeah. Not. No, well, like we, I'm sorry. So, but the assumption is that people listening to Crash in the Mode know what happened, but maybe not. Fair but enough. But that Bazovi has been subtly and emotionally, emotionally manipulating Brion's brother to to push Brion out of the country, right, and subtly manipulate him in ways, and then at the end of the season, manipulating Brion into terrible actions to take over his own country, right. And the fact that the way his manipulations work, the important footnote being that he can't make someone do something they don't want to do. Yes. He just kind of removes inhibitions. Inhibitions to it. And so it, so important here's note, here's it's like- It's not mind control. <laughs> it's not mind control. Right. So if he, if he goes through a step of saying like, yes, but Tara is safe now. Yes, but Tara has powers now. Yes, but Tara is being supported by the team now, right? Tara is safe. This thing that happened, what if you would just let that go? What if you forgive yourself from that, right? What if you go back in time and say, maybe my actions weren't so bad? Look at where we ended up, right? And you do this kind of real messed up, you know, uh, zigzag back and forth around these justifications. You justify one thing, it can lead to justifying another thing, can lead to justifying another thing. And that's how we get people making, like, people who are inherently trying to do the right thing, doing ter- making terrible, terrible choices, right? And so I agree with you. I, if he can peel back the onion layers back to who Brion, Brion was when he was 10 to 16, probably resenting his older brother for getting to be king for being born 16 minutes ahead of him or whatever. Yeah. Like, who knows what he was rebelling against at that time? Like, what does it matter that I go clubbing? Nobody cares about me, right? <laughs> I'm not Gregor, right? Like, who knows? Like, all that's... I can think about that and go, okay, all that is a reasonable character development situation, right? But yeah, I, I, I'm not sure, like you say, it's not a direct line. Yeah, of right? course not. Not I, trying I, to I see, not I trying see to that. accuse someone of making a mistake at sixteen, leading to them overthrowing no, the government. Right. We're both not on what that I page. am trying to say at yeah, all. Absolutely, we're both on that same page. Not a straight line, but it also doesn't necessarily. So, and in that straight line, also doesn't necessarily make me go like, oh, now all that ending makes sense. Yes, the ending still not- still feels like we got a few more episodes to go that we might pick up on some things that we see like here that we that we noticed here, but. I'm st- that that ending still uh I I don't want it to be feel as much of a reach as it as it is. Like it's it's a pretty hard heel turn <laughs> on Brion in one episode and so I'm I'm hoping that there are a few more things that I just didn't pick up on, you know, that I I will find as we dig through these as well. So We've had a f- we've had a few so far that make things make sense for me. Unless we'll see if there's unless one. He's really unless it's unless become. he's calm and he's lying about the subtlety of his manipulative powers. Sorry, I'll take the hat back off. It slipped back on again. I'm okay now. It's okay. It's, okay. <laughs> it's a fashionable hat. It's a yeah, fashionable thanks. hat. Very fashionable tinfoil hat. All right. And I, with that, I think that's it. Uh, do you have any other crashing the mode? No, I, don't think, I think that's it. Other <laughs> than, you know, we're going to have a couple episodes of Superboy and Miss Martian working through that. Psychic argument coming up. <laughs> yeah, for sure. It's it's my trash, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. All right. And with that, I think we can say it out of the Watchtower. Thank you for spending some time with us. If you'd like to join us in discussing this incredible series, you can find us on Twitter at the YJ Files, on Facebook at Crashing the Mode, on Tumblr at the YJ Files.tumblr.com, and on our website, Crashing the Mode.com. And if all of that isn't enough, you can email us directly at whelmedpodcast at gmail.com course you can also find us to leave comments and such on youtube stitcher spotify and iHeartRadio. 
If you'd like to support our show, please consider sharing it with a friend and joining our chats on social media. You can also support the show by giving us a five-star review and or rating on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. The ratings, comments, and subscriptions help others find the show. If you do leave us a rating, please let us know at our email address or on social media, especially if you live outside the U.S., since we have to look a little harder to find those ones. If you're able to support us monetarily, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash crash in the mode. Even $1 a month can help us do in-person interviews, actual play podcasts, fan meetups, discussion sessions, and more. And remember, stay whelmed, everyone. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening and stay whelmed. Well.